Hi everybody! Welcome to another Scratch tutorial. In this tutorial we will be going to have a look at the various supported grading panels and how to set them up correctly in Scratch. First of all, Scratch supports the following grading panels. The Tangent Element, the Tangent CP200, the Tangent Wave and the Avid Artist Color. Note that Scratch can utilize as many element panels as you want to work with. Once connected to the workstation, you need to tell Scratch what panel you want to work with. Therefore, go to the System Settings, to the Preferences, and here on the first tab you have the panel setup. The various panels are listed here and can be turned on and off. For the Tangent CP200, you need to fill in the serial number which is displayed on the panel's displays and their respective IP addresses. For the Tangent Element, which is covered behind the Tube Tangent Unified Bridge Engine entry, you just need to enable them and then click the Override Mappings button. Note that the Override Mappings button will override any mapping that is associated with your current Scratch user. So if you have done any kind of uh, mapping, customized mapping to your user, uh, pushing this button will override the mapping with the default mapping for the selected panel. Once activated, you need to restart Scratch once to make the setting be applied. Before we continue, two little things about the element panels. First of all, please make sure to use a powered USB hub if you don't connect the panels directly to the workstation because every panel needs at least 500 mA to work properly. Second, please make sure you have the latest version of the Tangent Hub software from the Tangent website installed. This way, Scratch can recognize the panels properly. If you take a look at the Tangent Synapse software, which ships with the Tangent Hub software, you can see the order of elements inside this app. And this order is actually pretty important to make Scratch recognize the panels in the correct order. So please make sure that your setup looks exactly like this, which it should by default. Okay, so let's jump right into Scratch and have a look on how to configure our panel mapping the way we want it. Once inside the project, click play to enter into the player. Right click to go to the settings menu, where you will find the configure panels button inside the general section of the settings. Okay, here we can modify our panel mapping. The panel config menu consists out of several sections. The first section is the group section, which lists each and every group that is contained in the current mapping. A group contains a set of controls for a special purpose. For example, group 1, the primary group, contains all the controls necessary to do primary color correction. The second group contains the controls for the keys and so on. You can cycle through those sets of controls via your panel. For instance, pressing a key on the first group, like so, adds a frame reference to the tray. If we would be on a different group, such as the layers group, Pressing the same key has a different function. This brings us to the next section, the mapping pairs. Whenever you push a button on your panel, the corresponding mapping pair gets highlighted in the list, depending on which group you are. So here you can quickly see what button does which action. The next section lists the encoders and knobs on the panels. Here again, when you push a button, it will get highlighted. And also the scratch controls on the other side. And you can map pretty much any function inside Scratch to a button. Last but not least, the group text labels. Here you can define what should be shown on the panel's displays. Alright, first I want to draw your attention to the active group control which lets you cycle or select the groups that you created. If you scroll down the mapping list, you will at some point find 
the active group mapping. And as you can see, the active group control is mapped to two different buttons on the MF panel. The difference between the two is the scale value, actually. Now the scale value basically defines the sensitivity of a control. If used with an encoder, each increment of the encoder will be multiplied with the scale value and this is then the amount a scratch parameter will change when turning the encoder. Same goes for a button. So, if this button is set up with a scale value of 1, it will basically tell Scratch, well, go just one step forward, or use the next group. If it would be set to 2, it would use the second next group, and so on. Then again, if set to minus 1, it will basically do a step back and select the previous group. The next setting is the acceleration value. This basically controls how quickly the scratch parameter changes depending on how fast the panel control is moved. This is most frequently used for encoder knobs or trackballs so that a quick movement increases the scratch parameter by a large amount but a slower movement adjusts the parameter by a small increment. Speaking of encoders, an encoder can be used to modify a certain parameter, like the pregame. So in this case, turning the encoder moves the pre-gain of the current image. An encoder cannot only be turned, but also pressed. In this case, it will reset the pre-gain value. To set up a control this way, we need to work with the map values here. As you can see, turning the encoder is mapped to the pre-gain for the red channel. And at the same time, to the map zero value of the same. If we press the button, Scratch actually jumps to a different control, which is also mapped to the pre-gain of the red channel, but this time is mapped to 1. Actually, this works with most of the controls that can be mapped to an encoder, or a ball, or a wheel. The map zero will define the parameter, and the map one will simply reset it. A little exception on the map values are the color wheels and balls. For instance, let's have a look at the gamma controls. We have the ring for the overall gamma control, which is mapped to zero, and we have the ball on the x-axis, which is mapped to one, and also on the y-axis, where it is mapped to two. Another use case for the map values is, for instance, the canvas select setting. As you can see here, it has a map value of 3, and here it has a map value of 4. What it does is pretty simple. Let's have a look. When I create a new layer with that button, I can either create it directly with a rectangular canvas, or, with the map 4 value, create a circle canvas. Note that every group can have an alternative mapping which applies when pressing the ALT key. You can define this mapping by pressing the button here and now assign each control with an alternative function. To press the ALT key, simply hit the A or B button on the element panels. To make use of the ALT functions, simply press and hold the ALT key on the panel. As long as you hold the ALT key, the ALT functions will be available on the panel. When you release it, the panel will switch back and show the original functions. Alternatively, you can double tap the ALT key, like so, and lock it so you don't need to hold it down all the time. To unlock it again, just tap it once. To create a new mapping, simply hit the desired button on the panel to get it highlighted. Now in this case, there already is a mapping on that button, which adds a frame reference to the tray. Let's quickly delete it, so the button is unused. So let's quickly search for another function to map on it. For example, the grade function to switch the grade on and off. Here we are, toggle grade. 
and create a pair. Done. When we now hit this button, the grade of the shot, let's have a look, will be turned on and off. Okay, so we changed the mapping of the button. The other thing that we still need to do is to change the display labeling, because the display label still says frame ref. To do so, just select the corresponding row, go down here, and type in grade. Hit enter, and the display will change instantly. Lastly, let's have a quick look on what's going on under the hood. Therefore, let's quickly switch to the finder and navigate to the assimilator folder inside library application support on your system disk. Inside the assimilator folder, there's a folder called users containing each and every user that you created inside Scratch with its own folder. Inside this folder, you can see various instances of a file called CS Mappings. The latest one, the one without a number attached to it, is the current one that's being used when using Scratch. As soon as you modify any control inside the settings, a new file will be created and the old one will get a number attached to it. So if you need to go back to a previous mapping or something, you can find it in one of those iterations of the CS Mappings file. When you create a new user that does not have a customized mapping attached to it, Scratch will be using what's inside the settings folder here. This kind of is the general mappings file for the selected panel. When you choose to select another panel inside the panel preferences, this CS mappings file will be replaced with the corresponding mapping file for the different panel. Then again, when you hit the Override Mappings button, the general CS Mappings file here will be copied to the Users folder and override the current CS Mappings file inside the User folder. If you are on Windows, let's have a quick look. It's kind of the same here. This is the path that you need to go to to find the Assimilator folder. Note that the Program Data folder on your system drive is a hidden one. And inside here you also have the user folders, this time without a CS mappings file, and also the settings folder. This concludes the tutorial about panel mappings and panel setup inside Scratch. Hope it was useful to you and see you next time.